you were born in uh, 1943 in New York. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and your families? Um, so we know that you came from a, a family of musicians. Uh, we have a photo of your uh, parents playing guitar and cellos. Um, how do the music influence you, for example? I remember, I think one of your questions was, that it showed a picture of me looking into the engine room. It said, if I was, I was, was I interested in science from the age of three? Well, <clears throat> probably, but I wouldn't have put it that way. I knew I was interested in things like engines and how things worked. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, when my parents said they wanted they were going to take me to meet some uh, friends of theirs who were musicians. I was very excited because I thought they had said magicians. <laughs> so it took me a while, but by the time I was five or six years old, I certainly wanted to be a scientist when I grew up. So um, do you remember whether there were any figures that sort of influenced sort of your, your interest in, in, in science from the early well, age? I think both my, my father and my mother, uh, although they were not scientists themselves, my father was pretty good with, he liked to, he had taken a physics course with a teacher that he liked very much. And he got a good intuition of it also because he was a sort of practical person. He, he and my mother uh, architected and built the house that, that I grew up in. And he was an amateur astronomer. So he would, he would explain things to me in a physics-y way, like saying this telescope mirror, which is about this big in his telescope, uh, it had to be so smooth so even, and it's, it's not, of course, not flat, it was, it was a concave, but it had to be so smooth that if it were the size of New York State, the biggest bump would be about two inches tall. So th he, was th he thought like a physicist. And my mother wanted to study literature in college, which she had majored in that, in English composition fact, but she had had to take a, a, a science course for a requirement, and she took a zoology course, which she liked very much. So whenever I wanted to know what does the stomach do or what does the liver do or the lungs, how does it all work? She understood pretty well when explaining those things. So I started being very interested in biology, but really all the sciences. I had a little notebook when I was in uh, high school where I worked in chemistry and mathematics and physics and biology, especially looking at the little animals and, and, and uh, algae and so on in, in pond water. I think I had a, a, a mentor in the form of David Sprinson, who was a biochemist. He was, the, he was one of the people who discovered the biochemical pathways for synthesizing uh, amino acids like uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine and, and tryptophan, which have a benzene ring in them. So I, I, got, I, I thought I wanted to be a biochemist. And when I went to college, they didn't have a biochemistry department for, for undergraduates. So I said, I said, well, just go to study chemistry. So I did that. And while I was doing that, somebody told me about uh, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. In, you know, that sounds like an almost impossible thing to believe, and what, what are you talking about, and so on. But I got very fascinated. And I drifted over towards physical chemistry and towards the mathematical aspects of things, and hoping that I could find some connection between computability and physics. So when I finally went to graduate school, I was involved as a teaching assistant in a course uh, which was taught by James D. Watson, or it was part of the course was taught by James D. Watson from, from the DNA fame. And naturally he used his book on the molecular biology of the gene. Uh, and it occurred to me more or less while I was doing that, that uh, RNA molecule, when it's being transcribed into, uh, uh, or translated into a, a protein by a ribosome, is pretty much a Turing machine. It's a tape and it's got a head that does stuff and moves around. And I thought that was a cute idea that hadn't been connected before. Well, then when I got a postdoc at the Argonne Laboratory doing uh, molecular dynamics calculations, calculation molecular motion of, of, uh, of atoms in order to, to a sort of numerical approach to statistical mechanics, I went with my advisor there who was also a very uh, dear uh, friend and, and mentor Anisa Rachman, uh, we went to hear a lecture by Rolf Landauer from IBM on the energy cost of computing. And he made an argument as to why computers needed to use energy. Of course, computers use a lot of energy back then, they do and they still do. But he said, was there any fundamental reason? And he had sort of explored some of the offhand things people said about this to the effect that anytime you you transmit a bit of information from one place to another, or you do a logic gate, it has to use up 
and convert from uh, from a useful energy into heat something of, of approximately the mean thermal energy of, a, of an atom at whatever the temperature of the computer is. In other words, the Boltzmann constant times the temperature, perhaps times the logarithm of two. So he thought about this and he, he recognized it was kind of not very rigorous thinking. And what he did was back, this is about 1961, he showed that certain operations did necessarily use that amount of energy and some other ones didn't. And the difference between those two was whether the operation had a logical inverse. In other words, if I want to change a bit, which I don't know whether the bit's zero or one, and I want to change it to whatever the other bit is, in other words, I want to, I want to flip it, that can be done with arbitrarily little energy. But if I want to take a bit that could be zero or one, and I don't know which, and when I'm done with it, it has to be zero, that has to use this minimal amount of energy, which people have been... So I started thinking about that. And while I was at Argon, it occurred to me I could put together this uh, idea of a Turing machine with calculating the energy that would be required to do processing and began to think about how to program computations reversibly. And so I had been already working on that, uh, pretty much done with that when I, when I uh, again, Landauer, really, I guess I was the first person who seriously thought about the stuff that he'd re written. He uh, invited me to interview there and I got a job there as a postdoc in what, 1972. And then I, I was hired and, and I stayed working with them and still working for them now. At which time of, of your career have you been familiar with, with the work of Shannon and the concept of classical information theory and entropy? And this, well, this that's kind of very interesting because I grew up right after his landmark paper. I was in, in uh, a second grade in school, I think, when it came out. So And, and also it was during my time that the Watson and Crick paper on DNA came out. I was kind of interested in DNA, but I hadn't really focused on it. And I was pretty much out of high school before it was really understood how it worked. So I didn't, I wasn't am amazingly impressed by that paper. Of course I was later. I think they hadn't really worked out how the ribosome uh, uh, decodes it at that point. It was just the DNA copying it itself it was sort of obvious from the Watson and Crick's paper. Well, anyway, so I'm not quite sure, but information theory was in the air. And one of the things that, that, uh, that really later on assisted me, I, I began thinking about it when, of course, I thought about thermodynamics because I, you know, anybody who studies chemistry thinks about that. When I was at Argonne, the idea that somebody could analyze the thermodynamics of computing was very exciting, it seemed like a really important idea. That's why I, I was excited to hear about uh, Landauer. Interestingly, Landauer had had a, uh, his, I think his, his advisor had been Leon Bruin, and who had had actually some wrong ideas about information theory. And some of what Landauer does, did was to correct these wrong ideas, which was that he tried, he analyzed Maxwell's demon in, in the, his book, which was one of the very early influential books called Science and Information Theory. I think it came out about 1956. And he, he said something that wasn't wrong, but was very, it, it, it led to a lot of misunderstanding. He said, well, the reason, the reason that the demon, everybody here knows what, what Maxwell's demon is? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I know it is. The, the reason it, that it can't violate the second law is that in order to sort the molecules and send the fast ones to one side and the slow ones to the other side, it has to see them, it has to observe them. And in order to do that, it has, a, it has a lamp, you know, and the lamp has to use at least one photon and the photon has to have more energy than the thermal background radiation, which is a KT per photon roughly. Uh, and therefore you have to use up that much energy to make the observation. So that was true, but wait, it wasn't what a mathematician would call a proof. He, he, he gave a way of making an observation that used more than the mean thermal energy. He didn't prove that any way of making the observation would do that. But people followed along with that idea, and that was what Landauer corrected. He showed that certain operations can be done with arbitrarily little, and what would be called thermodynamically reversible. If you do them very slowly, it uses less and less energy to do it. So I think in a way it may have been, I may have made Landauer happy by helping him refute the wrong idea of his advisor. So I, that's just my hypothesis at this point. So uh, anyway, it's probably okay to say that because they're I probably they're all they're I know I know Landauer is dead. I believe Bruin is also dead. So. Uh.
I've not committed any uh, slander. That was that was the milieu that that got me interested. But if you ask how I got interested in information, I can give you two stories about that. I was sort of always interested in mathematics. Uh, the person who got me really interested in algorithmic information, that is measuring information not by a prob property of a probability distribution, but by the minimal sized uh, number of bits required to specify that a number as a, as a as a program for a universal computer to compute that number. So in other words, from that point of view, the first million digits of pi has a very little algorithmic information content because you can make a short computer program to print them. But if you typically generate a, a million digits by coin tossing, then probably the, the most concise computer program to generate that has about a million digits. So that's the approach called algorithmic information theory. And I was turned on to that by Gregory Chaitin, who worked at IBM in the 1970s when I was, when I was first working there. So he was very influential. And I, I wrote a, a piece based on my conversations with him and the ideas of this field for the Martin Gardner column in Scientific American. But if you wanted to dig back farther, here is a, something that showed me what is fascinating and paradoxical about the notion of randomness. You might say that was this paradox lies behind algorithmic information of the notions of algorithmic information. So this, this didn't occur in a math class. This occurred in a, a, a drama production for my high school senior play. Uh, we were doing a Taming of the Shrew by Shakespeare. And we had a very good drama coach who was also our English teacher. You couldn't get, you couldn't pass his English class without really learning how to write, which is probably the most useful thing I learned in school. Anyway, we were re rehearsing this play, of course, back to the old uh, Shakespearean English, and he asked us to cut out a couple of lines from the script. And they were the lines where uh, Petruchio, who's the, the husband, who's about to marry this woman who everybody thinks is too bossy for anybody. And it, it's sort of archaic English. And the, I think the lines were, I forget what it was. Well, the, there was two lines. And one of them that, that I do remember was carouse full measure in her maidenhead. Well, this is a high school teacher. He doesn't want to bring up a part of, of the a reproductive anatomy and it, it was sort of embarrassing to teenagers and that would be they would ask about it because they didn't know what the word meant this is something back in the 1950s any wise uh, high school teacher would avoid so he just deleted it that way and I knew that's what he was up to so I said why are you deleting those two lines mr. blaze and he said well uh, the play was too long and it was beginning to drag so I had to cut out a couple of lines at random I said well why those particular two lines and he said they were more random than any of the other ones so the idea of being more random than something else was already planted in my mind when I was 17 years old. And then not much long after that, I came to someone who, who actually thought about that as a scientific topic. It's quite, quite fascinating. 